democracy is a very bad form of government, but I ask you never to forget. All the others are so much worse. shrink when you take them out of the water. That's a scientific fact. <laughs> hey, down there! You boys having any luck? Yes, some. What kind of bait you been using? They ain't been biting on the stuff I... <laughs> Get my bag out of the car. Maybe his skull fracture. He's in shock, losing a lot of blood. Where's the nearest hospital? Canaris, about five miles. You get there as fast as you can. Tell him to send an ambulance out here. Find the county sheriff, tell him what happened. What are you giving him? Nectothiamide for shock. There's a blanket in the car, get it. We gotta keep him as warm as we can. No. How is Sam? Oh, Dr. Kirk's still in there with him. This is Mrs. Fancher. How do you do? And this is Mr. Slattery, one of the men who found him. I keep telling him to be careful, but he's so clumsy. He's a big-footed ox. You know, last month, he tripped over a skate right in plain sight. He almost broke his nose just because he never looks where he's going. But I'll tell you one thing. No more fishing trips for him. He's not gonna... Are you Mrs. Fancher? That's right. I'm Dr. Kirk. Dr. Kirk? Dr. Kirk was fishing near where Sam fell. Mrs. Fancher, I'm sorry to have to tell you. Well, I guess Sam has good luck falling right into a doctor's lap. Your husband's dead, Mrs. Fancher. It's Nancy's birthday. We did everything we could to save him. Oh, Sam can't be dead. He told me he was coming home early today. He, he was going to decorate the house up. He was going... 
you'd better sit down. I'm sorry, Elsie. Till this afternoon. This afternoon? The kids are all at school except for Nancy. We got a sitter for her. It's a girl named Alice. She's real good with kids. Come on, Elsie. We'll drive you home. Oh, I don't know. Is there anything we can do to help Mrs. Fancher? I don't know. How am I going to tell the kids? Well, you can't win them all. I don't keep score, Doctor. All you can think about when a man dies is you should have saved him. I'm sorry. Come on, Kurt, I'll, uh, I'll drive you back to Campbell. Now, that could be premature, Doctor. Oh. What more can he do? Well, let me clue you in on the processes of grief, Mr. Slattery. At the moment, Mrs. Fancher is stunned. Her first thought is what she'll say to her kids, how she'll survive it. But in the next few days, on the advice of a relative or an emotionally uninvolved neighbor, she's going to contact a lawyer. Malpractice? Following a doctor's injunction almost as old as a Hippocratic oath, protect thy right flank. In case you don't know it, in this state, a good Samaritan is open game. I'd better wait for the autopsy and the coroner's report. Yeah, yeah. Well, call me when you get back. I'd like to know what happened. Yeah, I will. Well, Mr. Slattery, I rather expected you to be looking me up. Your bill has been assigned to my committee, I believe. Have you read it? I read all the bills dealing with the medical profession. What do you think of this one? Your reputation for precision and conciseness is justified, Slattery. You have a gift for legislative language. Thank you. Tell me, what uh, prompted you to introduce this bill? Mm, an incident. Maybe a justifiable fear on the part of a doctor friend of mine that responded to a call for help. And enough research to reveal the need for a Good Samaritan bill. Need? When a man says need to me, I'm always curious to know what need he's talking about. The great democratic need or the minority political need? I'm talking about the need of the next poor guy that gets racked up on the highway and passed by a doctor who's uh, afraid to treat him. A good Samaritan act, exempting doctors from any liability when they stop to administer emergency treatment to their injured fellow man. You have a very popular bill there, Slatter. It exudes sweetness and light. You want my help, I take it. I uh, recognize the political facts of life, Adam. Nothing gets through health and welfare without your uh, approval. That's true. Nothing does. I take it that you're prepared to argue its merits. No, I, uh, I think its merits are evident. And this time, I'm not in the minority. 32 states have a Good Samaritan bill. 13 states have turned it down. Two governors have vetoed such acts. And the one governor rejected it on principle. In the other states where the bill was turned down, it was turned down because the language wasn't right. In all the states where it was passed, there was practically no opposition. Let me give you something, Slattery. The distillation of 30 years' experience in this august chamber. It's Adam Smith's law, number one. Simply because there's no opposition to a bill does not make it a good one. You're against? I'm against. Well, I'd uh, be willing to redraft and clarify the language if you thought it was cloudy, Adam. No language will ever make that bill more palatable to me. Then why are you against it? I don't think I'm ready to discuss it yet. Let's wait until it comes up before the committee. Wait a minute. In other words, 
You were prepared to exercise your power of veto even before we discuss it? I've run this committee for 20 years, Slattery. Let me give you Slattery's law number one. Just because a thing has been done for 20 years one way doesn't mean it can't be changed. I'll be frank with you, Adam. I intend to see this bill passed one way or another. Frankness is a modern virtue, Slattery. In my day, we thought more highly of tact. But the greatest virtue of all was strength. And I have that. See you later, Yes, sir. I will. I will have him call you right away. Yeah, Mr. B-D, B-E-A-T-T-Y. Yes, sir. Have you talked to Mr. Smith? Yeah, I talked to him. Did he give you a reaction? He gave me a serving of his Victorian rhetoric spiced with aphorisms and reflections. He's against. Did that surprise you? John, I crowned Adam Smith. I want you to get me a list of all the medical legislation that's filtered through his committee in the last 10 years. You think you can do it? Sure. And then get a hold of Mr. Highland and the minority members of Health and Welfare. Tell them I'm going all out. It might have a little more weight if it came directly from you. Well, I'll get to them later. Just hoist the storm warnings. Okay. Yes? An attorney, a Mr. Jackson, is waiting to see you. I tried to get him to set up an appointment, but he wanted to wait. He said it was important. Now, let's see what's so urgent with Mr. Jackson. Yes, sir. Oh, and uh, a Mr. Beatty with Armada Insurance has been calling all day. He also says it's very important. Oh, yeah. yeah I'll talk to him later. Uh, send Mr. Jackson in. Uh, Mr. Jackson? Slattery. Sit down. Thank you. What can I do for you? Well, you can give me some information, if you will. You were fishing with Dr. Kirk the day of the unfortunate accident, weren't you? Yes, yes, that's right. Well, I'd like you to tell me about it. Everything you can remember. Well, suppose you begin by uh, telling me what your interest is. Certainly. I'm representing Mrs. Fancher in a malpractice suit. Against the Canaris Hospital? No, against Dr. Kirk. Protect their right flank. Physician, heal thyself. You seem surprised, Mr. Slattery. You're wasting your time, Mr. Jackson. You don't have grounds for a suit against him. Mr. Fancher was killed in a fall from the cliff. Dr. Kirk only tried to help him. I understand your sense of shock, Mr. Slattery, and I wish I could agree with you. But the facts are against it. What uh, facts? There was an autopsy, Mr. Slattery. The coroner determined the cause of death. Fancher was seriously injured in the fall, but not mortally. Death was caused by an allergic reaction to nicothamide, the drug that Dr. Kirk gave him in the field. In fact, Mr. Slattery, and inadvertently, Dr. Kirk killed him. You can't talk to the doctor right now. He's busy with 26 charity patients. Mrs. Levine, if the baby won't stop crying, look for pins. Well, then hold him against your breast and croon to him in Spanish. Well, even if you don't know Spanish, all kids love folk songs. Yes. Yeah. You're welcome. Well, these days, everybody's a mother. Flattery! Oh. <laughs> Since when? <laughs> Two days ago. I was stranded in Santa Fe and Roy wired the loop. I could have hawked my photo equipment, but I'm paying him back by helping him out here. Uh, Big Brother's always watching. Mm -hmm. Two days and you didn't call me? And interrupt Parliament. <laughs> and what would I say? I love you? <clears throat> when you get to be governor, I'll move into the mansion and get you impeached. Yeah, what makes you think I could make it without you along? Oh, you'd never make it with me along. <laughs> Nobody believes I'm Roy's official nurse. How do I look? Thinner. <laughs> I'm ordering these two sizes smaller, so I'll bulge in the right places. I want to make the world lusty. <laughs> well, how about me? Have I changed? Huh? Come here. Uh -huh. mm. There, that ought to be worth about ten votes. You feel better? Mm. Only if you're going to stay in town. Not your type of slattery. I hate politics. I can't balance hors d'oeuvre trays. 
I would insult the president of the League of Women Voters, and I'd ruin your button-down shirts. I can't control myself. It makes me nauseous. And I'm a rambler. <laughs> That's one habit I can't lick. Mr. Porter, I'm a busy Ooh. man, and I've got more important things to do than to keep putting like a shaft on his arm. I Ever since he got back from the fishing trip, he's been working 24 hours a day. When he's not belligerent, he's withdrawn. No, when you consider what he's been through. Was the medication really the cause of man's death? No, that's what the coroner's report said. That's not easy for a man like Roy to take. Oh, it's not that slattery. It's not just a reaction to guilt or remorse for having made a mistake. He's angry. He's seething mad at the whole world. I want to talk to him. Okay. And it stays on this time. You get that, Mr. Porter? Well, he keeps busting it off. Says it itches. You want the arm to heal crooked? You want to make a cripple out of him? Uh, no, sir. Then you see that it stays on and keep him out of the fields. You leave that cast on or I'll break your neck. Now get out of here. I want to see him next week. All right. I could use some coffee. Sure. That's, uh... Quite a little group you've got out there. How long has that been going on? Oh, a couple of months ago, a migrant worker wandered in here with a broken collarbone and no cash. I treated him. All of a sudden, I was the unofficial missionary to the sugar beet workers. Two days, sometimes three days a week. And we have converted what was a lucrative private practice into the most posh charity clinic in town. Now, don't start that start again. Anything. Here's your coffee. If you'll excuse me, I have some posting to do. A lawyer named... Uh... Jackson stopped by to see me this afternoon. Yeah, he was in here this morning. That paragon of the shady solicitors aren't the ambulance chaser. No, no, no. He's a reputable attorney. I checked. How much are they suing you for? $750,000. Three quarters of a million bucks. Is that reputable enough for you? Which they don't have a chance of collecting. Uh, don't give me any of your verbal palliative slattery. I heard about a doctor east of here that stopped to help a man injured in a car accident, got slapped with a half a million dollar suit that wiped him out. What was his name? Well, I don't know his name. Why should I remember his name? Because I won't take rumors and you won't take facts. I'm going to give it to you flat, Roy. Nobody's persecuting you. You're being sued because you made a mistake. Now, if you can pull yourself out of this miasma of self-pity long enough to listen, I say we can make a good defense. What do you mean, we? You're going to need an attorney. No, you've got your hands full. No, we've been friends a long time. I'm going to take your case. All right, I'll level with you, Slattery. From the minute this thing happened, I've been living with a knot in my stomach the size of a baseball. If they win this case and I lose my malpractice insurance, I'm out of business, through. You name your fee, I'll raise it. No, no fee, Roy. Well, I'll, I'll fight you for that later on. What do we do now? Well, first, I'm going to do a little exploring. And you get in touch with your insurance company and tell them I'm representing you. And just sit tight. I'll keep informed. Flattery. Thanks. All right, send in the next one. is shining. You know something, Mr. Slattery? I'm just standing here feeling envy for these chickens. They scratch around in the sunshine and they, they got food given to them. And most of all, they don't have to think. God was very good to chickens. Mr. Jackson said you'd probably be out here to see me. You're the doctor's lawyer, aren't you? Yes. And you've come out here to get me to call off the suit. Well, Dr. Kirk tried to help your husband, Mrs. Fatcher. He responded to a call for help. I know that. Well, do you think it's fair to punish him for it? Don't play near the car, honey. Sam was going to fix that car when he got a little money ahead. He used to spend his evenings out there laying underneath it, studying how he was going to fix it when he got the money. 
don't want to punish anybody. He tried to help and he made a mistake. But maybe if he hadn't tried, Sam would still be alive. How would you feel if Dr. Kirk had seen your husband in pain and not tried to help him? I'd hate him. And maybe that would have made it easier. But easy or hard, Mr. Slattery, my husband is dead. Sam's dead. And I gotta go on somehow. I got no choice. Raising those kids is up to me now, and that takes money. Maybe you can figure it out for me, Mr. Slattery. How much do you think a man is worth? But do I guess uh, how many years he might have lived and, and then multiply that by the money he was bringing in? And how much is it worth for kids to grow up without a daddy? And where else am I going to get the money? It can cost other people too, Mrs. Fancher. People whose cries for help may never be answered because doctors may be afraid to answer that call. You're talking maybes. My problem is real. I know it is. But the bigger problem is real, too. Well, then those other people will just have to face their problems the way I have to face mine. I told Mr. Jackson to get all he can. And you, uh... You won't reconsider? No, sir. I'm sorry. That's the way it's gonna be. Good, then you're gonna like this. You got the touch. <laughs> it's a secret formula. So. It's, um, it's nice of you to let me come over. <clears throat> what have you got in your mind? Well, I hate to see this case get to court. That's the long and the short of it. Uh -huh. I've come to know Dr. Kirk pretty well in the course of my investigations. And it isn't often that a guy like him comes along. He could be making $30,000 a year if he didn't do so much free clinic work. Hmm. Takes a lot of guts to dedicate yourself like that. Go ahead. Well, it's a shame that he's put himself in a position where he can be ruined for just one mistake. And you think this can ruin him? I've handled a lot of malpractice suits, Slattery. I've seen a lot of doctors eaten up by big judgments, crucified in the press. Now, well, you've laid a proper foundation for your pitch. Let's have it. It's no pitch. I just think it's to the best interests of everyone if we settle this matter. If you've got such a perfect case, why do you want to uh, settle it out of court? Well, for two reasons. First, I hate to see a good man spread all over the landscape. And second, Mrs. Fancher is broke. Took all of her money to bury her husband. There's some technical matter about her social security, and she can't afford to sweat out a long court case. Dr. Kirk carries $100,000 in liability. We'll be willing to settle for that. We're not. Do you want to talk it over with the lawyer from the insurance company? No, Beatty and I are in complete agreement. We're going to fight it all the way. I'm sorry about that, Slattery. If I have a client to protect, and if I have to nail Kirk to the wall, I won't like it. But I'll do it. See you in court. And it took about a half an hour for the ambulance to reach him. I stayed with him on the ride back to the hospital. And did you notify his family physician once you reached the hospital? I made inquiries. He didn't have a family physician. Were you solely responsible for his treatment once you reached the hospital? No, I was relieved by doctors Tucker and Rogers. You heard their testimony that in their opinion, the injuries suffered by Sam Fancher and his fall from the cliff were not mortal ones. Do you agree with that testimony? Well, there was evidence of skull fracture. I was sure the patient had gone into shock. So you administered nicothiamide? Yes. Is that a standard treatment in such cases? Yes. All right, doctor, just uh, one more question. Are you familiar with this quotation? I will share my substance with him and I will supply his necessities if he be in need. Yes, that's part of the Hippocratic Oath describing the duties of a physician. And did you take that oath before you were licensed to practice in this state? Of course. Do you feel bound to that oath? Yes. It's not legally binding, doctor. Did you know that? No, I know that. It's, uh, it's more of a moral obligation. I see. 
In other words, you felt duty-bound to go to the aid of Sam Fancher, is that correct? I had no choice. I had to help him. Thank you, Doctor. You have a very strong sense of duty, don't you, Dr. Kirk? I never thought of it just that way. I understand you have a very large charity practice. Yes. And that you also are a doctor who makes house calls. Yes. Well, with all this dedication to duty and availability, you must put in pretty long hours. I suppose. Well, would you say about uh, 12 hours a day on the average? Oh, about that, maybe a little more. Well, would, uh, say, 14 be a more adequate description? Yes, of course, less than that on Sunday. Let's see, that's 14 hours a day, six days a week. It comes to 84 hours a week, or a little better than double what the average man puts in. You know, I was very interested in this matter of moral obligation. Now, you say that a doctor is morally obligated to help his fellow injured man in an emergency. Well, that was approximately what I said. But you believe it? Yes, I do. Now, for the sake of discussion, wouldn't you say that there could be times when this wouldn't hold true? I can't think of any. Well, let's suppose the doctor is ill, that uh, he's under medication that may cloud his judgment. Now, wouldn't you say that this doctor should have the good sense not to interfere in a matter of life and death? Objection. The question is irrelevant and immaterial. Sustained. The reporter will strike the last question from the record. Oh, very well. Let's get back to this matter of your formidable work schedule. Do you ever take a vacation, Dr. Kirk? Rarely. But uh, when the accident occurred, you were on vacation. Yes, I took off four days of a long weekend. Now, the day of the accident, was that the first day of your vacation? No, it was the second day. What did you do on the first day? Well, I, I don't remember exactly. Well, maybe I can help you. Did you attend a cocktail party that afternoon at the home of Dr. James Moreland? That's right. I was there for a couple of hours. Were alcoholic beverages served at this party? It was a cocktail party, yes. And you had a couple of drinks. Objection. Sustained. And the court would like to know what the point of this line of questioning is, Mr. Jackson. I am trying to establish Dr. Kirk's condition at the time of the accident, Your Honor. May I continue the questioning? You may rephrase your question. Very well. How many drinks did you have at the cocktail party? I don't know. Two, maybe three. I see. Two or three. And then you had dinner at the Golden Pheasant restaurant. Did you have anything to drink there? One, before dinner. And then you played poker at the home of Dr. John Fenster. Did you have anything to drink there? Maybe. I don't remember. You mean you can't remember because you'd already had so many drinks? Objection. Sustained. Now, how late did you play cards that night? Two. 2.30, maybe 3. What time did you go fishing the next morning? We left at 4.30. And did the guide provide breakfast? No. We had intended to eat later in the morning. But the guide did provide coffee. Yes. Laced with brandy. I suppose so. And you drank it? Yes. You were fishing at Lake Huron, right? Yes. That's a mountain resort, I understand. Yes. Now, isn't it true, Doctor, that at high altitudes, alcohol hits you a lot quicker. Objection. To what, Mr. Slattery? The implication suggested by this line of questioning, if I may, Your Honor. Alcohol metabolizes in the liver at the rate of one ounce per hour, and oxygen is not rarefied below the 8,000-foot level. The altitude at Lake Heron is a little under 4,000 feet, Your Honor. Are you holding yourself up as a medical authority, Mr. Slattery? You have an opportunity to question the witness. Proceed, Mr. Jackson. What time did the accident occur, Doctor? It was about 6.30. How were you feeling at that time? I don't know what you mean. I think you do. You had five or six drinks in the 18 hours preceding the accident. You had no more than a couple of hours sleep. You had no breakfast, only coffee with brandy. Now, can you say that you were at the peak of your powers, Dr. Kirk? Can you say that this taxing period hadn't left its repercussions? I was competent to treat Fancher, if that's what you're getting at. Were you? Yes. Before you administered the nicothymide, did you check to see if Fancher was wearing a medical tag concerning his allergy to this drug? Of course I did. Did you hear Mrs. Fancher testify that her husband was wearing the medical tag the morning he went to go fishing? Yes. And did you hear the sheriff testify that there was no medical tag found near the scene of the accident? Did you hear that? He was not wearing a medical tag. You can ask the ambulance attendants. When you got to the hospital, 
you were relieved by doctors Tucker and Rogers. Yes. Why? They were on duty in the emergency room. Were you not sick at your stomach at that time? I don't see that that has any... Just answer the question. Were you not so sick to your stomach that you were incapacitated? Yes. Yet you say that you were competent to treat Mr. Fancher? Yes. Uh, do you contemplate a lengthy examination of this witness, Mr. Jackson? I do, Your Honor. Then, considering the lateness of the hour, this court will stand adjourned until 10 o'clock Monday morning. They're really out for blood, aren't they? Oh, not yours, Roy. It would clash with the state seal. Hey, why don't we all go over to Wings and get booze? I mean, that's what you're supposed to be, isn't it? An alcoholic practicing brain surgery? Oh, cut it out, Luke. Not before your lawyer tells me how it looks. I don't know. Well, who's supposed to know? What do you want me to do, Lucretia? Tell you the butler did it? Well, if you knew he was going to land on his head, why didn't you put down a mattress? Lucretia, please. <sighs> okay. Okay, I'm going. But when they cut off your head, be sure and get a new haircut, huh? Pay any attention to her. I know you're doing your best. Maybe your lawyer's not good enough. Or the doctor he's defending. I understand he's got you between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, I've been squeezed before, Bert, but never like this. Well, what do you want out of me? I want HB 1849 switched to another committee. Oh, I see. If you can't hit a... Home run in the ballpark. You want to switch to one where the fences are lower? <laughs> I don't mind the fences. I just like an umpire that isn't blind. Meaning? Smith has set himself up as a one-man judge of the entire medical profession. It's all in here, Bert. All the bills that have been passed by health and welfare. And very few, if any of them, have ever given members of the medical profession an even break. Are you saying Smith is prejudiced? Uh -huh. It all fits. He's a victim of arthritis. One painful, crippling, common disease that no doctor can cure. And he's tried dozens of them. He also wrote a newspaper article, which is also in here, called Let's Take a Realistic Look at Doctors. Oh, I think you're stretching things now. All right, let, let, me, let me approach it from a different level, then. Let's just say that I don't believe in one-man committees. He thinks he owns health and welfare. And you think that's reprehensible? Yes, I do. It gives one man the power to veto an entire area of legislation. It leaves a Good Samaritan bill up to the whims of one man. It belongs in health and welfare. It'll stay there. If you want that bill, you'll fight it out in health and welfare. Nowhere else. I will. You can count on that. Well, I got about four hours' work to do before I can go home. Thanks, Bert. Flattery? I think your bill's a good one. If that's any consolation. Very little, Bert. Very little. <laughs> Yes, Sheriff. Yeah, and you searched the route he covered that morning? I see. Right. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Saturday morning, and the only ones working are the men who are slow or the ones who have fallen behind. Sit down, Adam. At times I find it more comfortable to stand. You know, it's really fortuitous your being here. I think I owe you an explanation. An explanation of what? The reason why your bill will be defeated on Monday. <laughs> You're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? At my age, I find it difficult to play, let's pretend. Are you familiar with that section of our state bill of rights which reads every person ought to find a certain remedy in the laws for all injuries and wrongs which he may receive in his person, property, or reputation? Yeah, I know the section. I believe in the Bill of Rights, Mr. Slattery. And yet your bill would make a doctor immune to liability and give the person he had injured absolutely no recourse under the law. Now, my bill has provisions against that. A doctor can't be protected for gross negligence. A gross negligence? No court's going to hold a doctor responsible on a broad generality like that. So you, uh, you scare them off. You make it hard for them to obey the moral dictates of their professions, eh? I've yet to see a man of real principle shy off from his duty just because he didn't receive advance assurance that he wouldn't be held responsible if he made a mistake. Well, you really have it in for him, haven't you, Adam? 
Uh, how do you picture yourself as a kind of a one-man judge to protect the general public against the stupidity and avarice of the medical profession? I protect them from blind worship, if that's what you mean. I realize that doctors are human. But the practice of medicine is an inexact science, which can't cure you. Which can't cure me, but that's really beside the point. So you make them really toe the mark. You know, you're in the wrong pew, Adam. You ought to be in some committee where the general public doesn't have to pay for your frustration and resentment. Are you accusing me of a conflict of interests? You said it. Then you have recourse. Take it to the rules committee. Try for the committee of the whole if you like. But before you do, examine the facts. Ask yourself how much credence the House will give to charges made by a man who leaves his desk to exonerate a friend and profit by a fat fee? In the days of my youth, the position we currently occupy would be described as a Mexican standoff. You'll be at the committee meeting Monday, or will your other duties prevent it? I'll be there. Wouldn't miss it. Should be very entertaining. I'll look forward to it. Have a pleasant weekend. I've missed this place, Lou. Not me. It's the same thing. You know, every time I come here, I discover something I haven't seen before. How about me? Same tired face? <laughs> it's been a long time. Get a chance to look at it. It's different. That's good, Slat. I don't want you ever to get tired of this old relic. I want to renew myself, so I'll keep you adoring me. <laughs> hey, hold still. What? You think you've got a win on your eyelid? I got a win? Oh, uh -huh, you have. Nobody ever told me that before. You know who else has a win there? Pablo Casals. Oh, well, the next time I come over, I'll bring my cello and you can photograph us. <laughs> me and my win. <laughs> <laughs> there. Feel better? I'll tell you later. How do you want your tea? Tea? It's my own invention. You outrage six tea bags, a stick of cinnamon, add ice, water, and a pinch of frankincense. You still take two lumps? Uh, you've got a good memory. Only for unimportant things. Mm -hmm. Like my life? I don't want to share your life, Slattery. I want to be it. You've got too much going on. You don't need me. Then why do I keep coming back? Because you want to make me feel good. Uh, <laughs> hey, where do you want to eat? Wings? Uh, maybe we could just, uh... Roy's coming by. <laughs> He's afraid, Slattery. You know something? He's afraid of you. Why is he scared of you? Maybe I'm the one that's scared, Luke. There's something between you two, something you don't trust me with. I think Roy's withholding something from me. He's your friend. He always levels with you. If it's anything, it's unimportant, something he forgot. No, it's not unimportant. He's a doctor. What do you want him to remember except pain? Honor he deals off the top of his head. Pity comes out of his hands. as much your brother as mine. Hi, sis. Hi. Hi, Slattery. Roy. Well, you don't exactly look like a barrister who has the world by the tail. Oh, I'm a little bushed, I guess. Tea, Roy? Tea? No, thanks. Although, maybe I better have something to Gloom in the room is so thick you could cut it with a scalpel. Well, we're all famished. Why don't we go down to Wings and get some chow? What's the matter, Slattery? 
something bothering you. I can read it like a fever. No, I was, uh... I was going over the transcript, Roy. One part of your testimony bothered me. Oh? What? You didn't check Fancher to see if he was wearing a medical tag. Well, are, you, are you saying that I perjured myself? Fancher was wearing a new medical tag that morning when he left the house to go fishing. The sheriff had his men cover every inch of that ground that he passed over, and they didn't find anything. Did you see a tag, Roy? What are you trying to do? I want an answer. All I could think about was the pain he was feeling. There's so much pain in the world. I was tired. I wasn't thinking clearly. That's the long and short of it. I was feeling. It's the worst thing a doctor can do. It clouds the judgment. I didn't even see the medical tag until I'd already given him the next time I had And it was too late. I started thinking about what was going to happen to me when they found out what I'd done. So I took the medical tag off and threw it away. When we got Francher to the hospital, I did everything I could. But it was too late. Why didn't you tell me this? Stop it! He's not in court and you're not his prosecutor. I'm not judging him, Lucretia, but I can't defend him without the truth. The truth? You talk like you have a corner on it. All right, I'll give you the truth. A doctor stopped to help a man who fell off a cliff. And now he's about to get his license to practice revoked because of one fine, noble, generous impulse. Lucretia, I covered up a mistake. Oh, and is that a crime worth hanging for? If he corrects his testimony, it's likely there won't be any penalty. Jackson's offered to settle. Will it end there? No. No, he'd probably have to go before the medical board. I don't know what to do. You do nothing. That's what you do. I really have a choice? Oh, you have a perfect choice. You can deny you've said anything. Slattery can't contradict you. And there's no proof against you. All right, settle it out of court. Help Mrs. Fancher if you want to. Oh, but don't throw your life away. Maybe she's right. Look, Roy, I, I know what you're going through under the same circumstances. I, I might have done the same thing. I know what fear can do. But that's what you were going to say, wasn't it? A qualification. Well, let, let's look at it this way. I treat over 100 migrant workers a week. I suppose I take the grand plunge. I'm put out. What happens to them? No, there are other doctors with a sense of charity. So you take Roy. away all the odds, just like that. Now, you listen to me. I'm a doctor, and it was my duty to help that man out there in spite of my condition. If your bill had been passed, I wouldn't even be in this situation, would I? Well, I don't know, and that's the truth of it. Maybe if you hadn't been afraid... If I hadn't been afraid, I wouldn't have thrown away the medical tag, but the man would have still died. That's the only difference. You know what you're saying? You're saying, step in, doctor. Help out. We'll protect you. But you're also saying you better be careful. Don't make any mistakes and error in judgment, because if you do, you've had it. You're trying to legislate idealism and perfection, my friend. And it can't be done! Look, there, there's no point in going on with this. I don't care about ethics or dilemmas or moral discussion. I just want a straight answer. If Roy decides to settle and keep his mouth shut, what are you going to do? Do you want an answer and to prove my friendship, Lucretia? Are you that unsure? All right, I'll tell you what I want. Roy, I want to put you on the witness stand. I'm going to pound you until you tell the truth. If you don't want that, then you better get another lawyer. You still want to have dinner?
this reserved? Yeah, for peasants and pigeons. You, uh, know you're littering the park. You always were a lousy pigeon feeder. You don't just throw that stuff out like you're rolling dice. You don't, huh? Oh, you were scattering it around like you didn't care whether they ate it or not. You gotta share it with them. See? I mean, not, not too much. That's part of my lunch. <laughs> you didn't eat either. No. No, I was waiting for you. you know, what made you think I was coming? Mm. Boy, if you got an ego, you know that? Lou, what I don't know for sure, you fill me in on, okay? I mean, I didn't even know I was in the park, but you found me here. What else don't I know? Well, sometimes a little pigeon feeding is worth more than a thousand words. Chinese proverb. What else don't you know? Well, you don't know that right now Roy is trying to settle his suit out of court. Well, that takes care of that. And Mrs. Fancher. Yeah, and Mrs. Fancher. You could try and stop him. No, I'm not his lawyer anymore, remember? Didn't you hear what I said? He's about to meet Jackson to make the settlement. Isn't that what you want? To save his career? What good's his career? He tears himself apart every time he tries to prescribe an aspirin tablet instead of broken bone. Just because he once made a mistake. I was wrong, Slattery. You were right. He can't live this lie. You've got to stop him. I can't take him off the hook, Lucretia. Who's asking you to forgive him? Just, just be there. Is that too much? What a remarkable instrument a stethoscope is. Magnifies all the sounds in the human body. But it's rather useless for twinges of conscience. Did you ever hear a conscience twinge, Larry? Practically undetectable. I made the settlement. Yeah, yeah so I heard. God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. I guess you realize your chances of being underwritten for malpractice insurance is probably zero right now. Well, that's the price of expediency, my friend. Thanks. So how goes it with a good Samaritan bill? In about a half hour, the committee room will begin to fill up for an informal requiem as HB 1849 is laid to rest. Maybe it's for the best. Well, you want to defeat it? Would it startle you if I did? It's a good bill. You sure of that? Well, it, it does something that needs doing. Yeah. Yeah, but it's got loopholes, Roy. It's got loopholes that can't be plugged. Provisions that can be abused. And an unscrupulous man can hide behind it. Like me. And me, Roy. I wanted you off the hook, and I'm not sure I cared how you made it. Who am I to condemn you? I called the medical association this morning, gave them all the facts, everything that happened. I'm supposed to go in this afternoon and make out a sworn affidavit. They'll notify me when my hearing's to be. I guess I just got tired of running scared. I was scared out there at the lake when I realized what I'd done. I was scared when I took the medical tag off of it. I was so scared at that hospital, I was sick from it. I was scared in the courtroom. Scared enough to start backtracking when you guessed what I'd done. Well, fear is just as bad for a doctor as emotional involvement. You, you can't live with it, you can't work with it. You know what the board will do? Well, I know what they can do. They can revoke my license, or they can issue a formal reprimand and let it go at that. But the uh, bill's what's important right now. What do I tell the committee? Tell them what you just told me. Let them know, Roy. You've got to let them know what terrible things a fear in the gut and an unreasonable panic did to a truly fine doctor. Will it do any good? It better. Because if it doesn't, will you answer the next cry for help? Will any doctor? All right, let's 
let's go.